Salut Yves, ça va? How's it going, everyone? Salut Yves, ça va? Bonjour Yves. Hi everyone, this is the uh, Canadian Foreign Policy Hour. I'm just having a little technical thing here. I'm coming to you from uh, uh, Jojagate, which has long been a meeting place. Sorry about that. Uh, so this is the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour, having some little technical issues. <laughs> uh, thanks everyone for uh, uh, coming out. Uh, and uh, we got a, our special guest tonight of uh, Norman Finkelstein. So I'll try to get through the uh, summary of uh, the recent developments in Canadian foreign policy, which there are uh, an, uh, quite a number of. Uh, first of all, begin by talking about um, Trudeau was in Mexico the uh, last week, and uh, he continued a really great tradition that Stephen Harper maybe instigated or maybe started before that of meeting a, a mining executive when he's on an international trip. So after meeting with Biden and uh, and Mexican President AMLO, uh, Trudeau met with uh, the CEO of. Uh, Torex Gold, which has operations in, in Mexico. So continuing to support Canadian mining companies operating globally. In Peru, uh, there was a terrible massacre, about six, I guess maybe it was last Monday, and uh, 17 people were killed, mostly indigenous. And the uh, just reported that um, the, the police in Peru were being told to search for leftist books, books by Marx and Lenin, are, are specifically cited. They've expanded the state of uh, the curfew and we're seeing nothing from the Kane government, nothing critical, continue to support what is uh, increasingly obvious is a very repressive 50 people killed in about uh, 45 days or so, 50 days. And uh, and clearly there's the general strike continues. So there's clearly significant, significant opposition. So uh, that's an interesting story of how much Canada has has been aligned with the U.S. in backing the ouster of Pedro Castillo in uh, in Peru. Matthew Bethrens posted on Twitter about how uh, this was two days ago, I believe, uh, uh, day five, and uh, Jagmeet Singh, the leader of the NDP, still hasn't said anything about the F-35. Unfortunately, I think we're at day seven now, and I have not seen anything from uh, from Singh. So even though the NDP had officially said they opposed the F-35, they have clearly just basically fallen in line with the government on that. On the 12th of January, it was the anniversary of the uh, terrible earthquake in Haiti, the 13th anniversary 2010 earthquake that left hundreds of thousands of people dead. And uh, well, it's unclear, but somewhere between around 100,000 and 250,000, I think is the probably the, the correct estimate. Uh, horrible, mostly port au prince but in the surrounding uh, regions as well. and. I know I think I've mentioned this in previous sessions, but it's just such an important document. It gets so little attention. It goes to the heart or really, quite frankly, the lack thereof of heart in Canadian foreign policy, which was the Canadian government's reaction to the earthquake in 2010. Horrible, you know, devastating scenes. Anybody with any sort of hum humanism, humanity, uh, even, you know, very right wing, uh, quite frankly, racist, anti-Haitian people, saw the, the images and were, you know, struck by what was going on and to seek to, you know, provide some degree of relief. The Canadian government did not send the heavy urban search and rescue teams 
based in cities across the country, but instead sent 2,000 troops. The Americans sent about, uh, I think, about 15,000. And a year after the earthquake, we found out with internal government documents reported on by the Canadian press, reported on why they didn't send the heavy urban search and rescue teams and why they sent the troops. And it said, quote, Canadian officials were, quote, worried about political fragility has increased the risks of a popular uprising and has fed the rumor that ex-president Jean-Bertrand Aristide, currently in exile in South Africa, wants to organize a return to power. And went on to say that Haitian authorities want to strengthen Haitian authorities to, quote, contain the risks of a popular uprising. So amidst this horror in Haiti, the Canadian government's concern was how do we control Haiti? How do we make sure there's not a political vacuum? Uh, how do we, how, quite frankly, how do we dominate the place? And honestly, there's not much more of a damaging document I'm, I'm aware of in the history of Canadian foreign policy, yet it receives almost no attention. It was reported on the Canadian press. As I mentioned, I've mentioned this previously, uh, the only newspaper, I did a uh, Canadian news stand search of this, the Kamloops Daily News was the only newspaper that mentioned this story in the paper. They almost all have Canadian press wire copy. They didn't mention it. And, uh, and the Haiti file is one that there's been some uh, developments on. On uh, a couple of days ago, Labor Against Arms Trade tweeted, quote, on Tuesday, the last 10 remaining senators in Haiti's parliament officially left office, leaving the country without a single democratically elected government official. On Wednesday, a Canadian military aircraft delivered armored vehicles to the Haitian National Police. So it's quite effectively contrasting. There's no democracy in Haiti. There's no, I mean, already you had a, a regime, a prime minister, a leader that you know was unelected, unconstitutional, unpopular. But now there's not, you know, there's no elected official in the whole country. And yet Canada is deepening its ties to the Haitian police. And that's not a coincidence, right? The parallel, of course, is, is in 2004, after ousting the elected government, Canada spent tens and tens of millions of dollars, led the UN police contingent, had many, many police trainers supporting the police, uh, which was in stark contrast with, to when there was the elected government of Aristide, and they ended in 2000, they ended, uh, basically ended all assistance to the police and the judicial system. So when there's non-elected and non-democratic situation in Haiti, the Canadian government is, is inclined to increase its uh, support for the Haitian police. When there's a popular government that, uh, in the case of Aristide, the most legitimate, electorally speaking, government in the history of the country, they, they uh, withdrew their uh, uh, support. And, and basically the Haitian police, you know, there's many facets to understanding the Haitian police and why Canada has spent incredible resources, incredible resources for the past two decades in building this force up from about 5,000 in 2004 to about 15,000 uh, today and why they sent these light armored vehicles. And this is the follow-up from the delivery back in October with the American aircraft, uh, military aircraft that delivered the initial batch. Uh, and, and, you know, part of it is to, to it's a force to, maintain the regime that we we back more broadly it's that the you know the elite in haiti that are an infinitesimally small proportion of the population in where the vast majority of the population is in dire uh, impoverishment the class divide in haiti which has a very big racial component to it is is absolutely uh um completely stark and you need a force to basically maintain that order historically it had been the military that the Americans created after invading in the 1915. And that was disbanded by Aristide in 96, which was a big, big development, positive development for human rights in the country. And what we did after the 2004 coup was we brought former military into the police force and took basically had former military throughout the police force, all the positions of authority and almost all the position, positions of authority and turned it much more into a tool of, of political uh, uh, repression. Uh, so the, the Haitian military is an institution that we have devoted incredible amount of resources to, and the Trudeau government is continuing 
even though there is not even a pretense of any, there's not even a scam election. I mean, these have been, they've been scam elections in Haiti in, in recent years, of course, but now they don't even have like that, you know, a sort of sham kind of electoral a facade. And we're, we're putting huge amounts of resources, continuing to put huge, huge amounts of resources, $42 million in 2022 into the Haitian uh, 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 police. So Trudeau, when he was in uh, in uh, Mexico, just after meeting Biden in uh, Mexico City the, this past week, he de- he declared, quote, we need to make sure that the solutions are driven by the people of Haiti themselves. OK, so he is in Mexico City meeting with the U- Mexican and American presidents and ensuring that the Haitian people are going to lead, lead the solution simultaneously. International Development Minister uh, Harjit Sajjan was also in his global effort to ensure it's a Haitian-led solution to the crisis. And he was in Jamaica and in Barbados, of course, to ensure it was a Haitian-led solution. Just as Melanie Jolie has been all across the hemisphere, speaking with all uh, politicians all around the world, ensuring, again, it's a Haitian-led uh, solution, not a not a Canadian-led solution, a Haitian-led solution. Um and it's just remarkable to see this pumped out endlessly by liberal government officials and the media just just laps it up right i mean like the guy who leads haiti was appointed by the us and canada only 18 months ago through a tweet that that again was a haitian led solution and he comes from a political party the PHTK, where we installed the us and canada installed martelly in 2010 uh uh, but this again, all this is all Haitian-led uh, 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 solution. Um, so it really goes to just the incredible propaganda. Uh, the media doesn't doesn't bother testing it, right? And Trudeau can just you know spew the lies endlessly on uh, on international affairs and generally, and particularly the weaker the country, the more the lies uh, can be can be uh, uh, over the top. Uh, so the Japanese Prime Minister uh, Kish- Kishida Fumio was in Ottawa, uh, I think, on Wednesday and Thursday, and then he went down to uh, Washington, I think, maybe on Friday. And uh, and this is part of this deepening uh, Anglosphere alliance with remilitarization of Japan and basically kind of goading China into provoking China into maybe a conflict over over Taiwan. And of course, uh, uh, maybe a week or two weeks ago now, Japan announced a big plan to double its military spending. They're going to buy Tomahawk missiles that can hit China uh, from the U.S. And Canada immediately came out in favor of this this remilitarization of Japan. And, and there's you know there's a whole history there of what China did, or what Japan did in China in the 1930s. Um, that's kind of in the backdrop of of some of, of some of this. And one of the good things that came out of World War II was. A, a more sort of pacifist uh, Japanese uh, constitution, but we're pushing against, you know, moving away from that. And and um, amidst this, the uh, the commander of the Third Maritime Expeditionary Force and Marine Forces, uh, American James Bierman, Be- uh, was, uh, was quoted about a week ago in the Financial Times, uh, basically contrasting American policy on Ukraine to on Japan, Taiwan, Philippines, and vis-a-vis China. And he's basically saying that it was a big success. We're having this big success in Ukraine because after 2014, after the ouster of uh, Yanukovych, we we got ourselves prepared for this like war with Russia. And so he says, quote, why have we achieved the level of, level of success we've achieved in Ukraine? A big part of that has been because after Russian aggression in 2014 and 2015, we earnestly got after preparing for future conflict, training for the Ukrainians, pre-positioning of supplies, identification of sites from which we could operate support, sustain operations. And then he goes on to say, <clears throat> we call that setting the theater. And we are setting the theater in Japan, in the Philippines, in other locations for that presumably upcoming war conflict with China, probably over Taiwan. And um, so this is this is where the American military is at. This is where the Canadian, Canadian government, Canadian military is pushing for. Yesterday, the uh, um, Bob 
Oterloni, who's the head of Canadian Joint Operations Command, he complained that Canada is not part of the AUKUS, He's the uh, British, U, uh, Australian, U.S. Uh, military slash nuclear submarine kind of accord. And he said then Canada wants basically have a bigger role in, in the region. And he, he, he congratulates the Trudeau government for the new uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, but he wants, you know, even more Canadian military presence in, in, in the region. And so, the, you know, I, I'm, I'm of the opinion that we need to be talking about what Canada did in terms of provoking Russia's aggression. Again, a brutal, brutal war, illegal, clearly, uh, but we did provoke. It's not unprovoked, contrary to the, the commonly stated position of Canadian officials, uh, that we need to talk about that background to, to know where we should go forward, right? So the Canadian government just announced $470 million to buy a U.S. missile defense system to give to the Ukrainians. And now today, Trudeau is saying we, we have about, I think, 112 of these German-made tanks that now the, the Ukrainians are going to ask us for formally. Germany has been resisting sending these because they see it as further escalating. Now Trudeau is saying we're not against doing that. So now it looks like I think Poland has already announced they're going to send a first batch of maybe it's a dozen. And, and the Germans have now, they have their licensing rights. So no country can send them to Ukraine without German okay. Um, and so so we need to like understand the 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 ways in which we provoke the conflict to know how we should, you know, get out of this horrible war in Ukraine, which is not to continue escalating, which we've been escalating now for eight years, and we just continue escalating and escalating. It's not to do that. And so we need to know that history to know how we need to not move in the direction of sending more tanks. So, you know, I, I'm of opinion that we need to be talking about the history to, to figure out a way out of Ukraine. But but in fact, we need to be talking about the history so we don't end up in another one of these horrible things uh, in Taiwan or with China, um, because the militarists don't see this as a failure in Ukraine. They see this as a success and they want to replicate that. Uh, and, you know, again, anyone, anyone with a, you know, a bit of humanity wants to ensure that, you know, what we're seeing in Ukraine doesn't happen elsewhere but that's not necessarily what the uh, what the militarists are uh, are uh, are thinking um so so uh, a couple of days ago I, I thought got the idea I'd invite uh Norman uh, Finkelstein who I'm sure most people are familiar with he's a you know well-known author of a dozen books I invite him uh, have him come on uh, uh, to discuss uh, a few issues but what got me thinking about it got me, was that um I wrote this piece uh, critical of an article that Canadian Dimension published about three weeks ago. And it was this uh, criticism of a op-ed in the Ottawa Citizen by a right-wing nationalist, Royal Military College professor, right-wing nationalist, Ukrainian, uh, Lubomir uh, Lusyuk, I think is how you pronounce it. Uh, probably not, but uh, uh, and he's a he's right winger. I've criticized him. He, you know, he he wrote this piece in Ottawa Citizens, very kind of odd piece about the Holocaust monument in Ottawa that was set up that opened up in 2017. And at at the at the at the best, his piece was trying to sort of say there are more victims you know, expand the understanding of who the victims of the Nazi violence were. And at its worst, it was sort of justifying Ukrainian nationalist uh, killings of, of Poles and Jews uh, during World War II, their alignment with the Nazis in, in, in the, you know, horrendous uh, murderous kind of escapades. Now, so this is a piece by Jeremy Appel in Kane Dimension, which Kane Dimension really promoted hard. I, when I initially read it, I was, you know, I didn't really... Made troubled me this piece. I agree with part of it. Their criticism of of the sort of rehabilitation of Ukrainian uh, nationalist uh, neo Nazi aligned, uh, you know, or Nazi aligned during World War II and the sort of neo Nazis today and how that's tied into the whole NATO proxy war with Russia. But the article troubled me because it simultaneously really, uh, I guess I would say to put it crassly, really played into the sort of Holocaust industry uh, uh, narrative. And this this very narrow uh, understanding of the horrors of the Nazis, 
And um, and so what then came to mention really, you know, promoted this hard, which troubled me because I think, and it, you know, I got today, I got criticized by people, people at Canadian Dimension for having published this article, uh, challenging this, this article, their article they published. Um, and uh, I love Canadian Dimension. <laughs> for anyone from Canadian Dimension listening, I think it's uh, one of the best, uh, maybe the best uh, uh, left wing media outlet in the country. But but I really didn't think that they um, they were feeding into, quite frankly, um, the sort of Israel lobby narrative around some of this stuff. And, and it's not a coincidence that friends of Simon Weisenthal Center, uh, Sija, B'nai B'rith, all came out and criticized the the uh, the Ottawa citizens uh, piece from this Ukrainian uh, uh, right wing uh, uh, nationalist. And so Canadian Dimension sort of ends up on the same side. Uh, as as uh, as these uh, anti-Palestinian uh, groups, and so I thought I'd I'd ask uh, uh, you know talked about the subject with Norman Finkelstein because he is the the author of the book The Holocaust Industry, which was an important book uh, for me. I read maybe uh, 2002 2003 sometime after it just came out, and um, and it was very you know illuminating. Uh, it's very controversial. People get um, uh, get a lot of criticism. Uh, on this, if you if you uh, mention if you use that terminology, Holocaust industry. Anyway, so I thought I'd have uh, uh, Norman on to uh, to discuss um, discuss these matters. Uh, uh, Norman, are you uh, are you are you here? I don't see him, Eve. Uh oh. Hmm. Well, that's too bad. I uh, I got in touch. I called him earlier today, and then uh, sent, sent the follow up email. Um. So. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to. Uh, I don't know what to. Uh, uh, Perhaps try sending him a message again. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe I'll send him a quick. Uh, uh, note um while i do that do uh i guess maybe i'll just open it up to uh to uh to discussion um if anyone has any uh uh questions yeah i see you have his phone number, Eve. Would it be to text, send him a quick book? Yeah, text maybe, I'll do, maybe I'll do. Maybe I'll actually. I'm gonna actually just gonna call him quickly. <laughs> Eve, I wonder if you could post a link to the Dimension article um, so that some of us, I, I, I think I read it, but didn't think it through. I, I can, I, I, someone on my website, they have my, I posted my article. If someone could post that to, uh, to, um, uh, to the chat, uh, then they have, I link to the uh, Canadian Dimension piece. Hi, uh, uh, Norman. It's uh, Eve Engler. Uh, we st You're you're muted, you. Yeah, he should hopefully jump on in a in a second. But yeah, just to go a little bit further with the with the article, basically, how I see it, I, I agree with one part of of the of the article, which is that the Ukrainian, you know, this is rehabilitation of Nazis and neo Nazis as part of the NATO proxy war with Russia. The monument 
that was the Holocaust Monument in Ottawa that was set up in 2017, that was set up like quite explicitly via Israel lobby uh, uh, kind of pressure and dynamics. So Tim Uphol, the conservative uh, MP who had the private members bill, was uh, he talks about he goes on to a, a JPAC, the uh, what's it called, the Jewish uh, Public Affairs Committee of Canada. Um, I don't think that's the proper, but he so he goes on a trip to Israel with them, and that's where he gets committed to the idea of of, of doing pushing for the monument. And he's somebody who who spoke at APAC in 2010. He had a House of Commons resolution. Um, uh, uh, Critically, put forward a House of Commons resolution criticizing. Israeli apartheid week. So it's coming like totally coming from this sort of, you know, anti-Palestinian kind of kind of political forces. And in 2017, when it was when it was actually uh, uh, open, it was a bit of a controversy around it. And Amira Haas, the uh, Haaretz journalist, wrote this piece, this column in 2017, basically critical of the monument and saying, you know, why aren't there any monuments at and I don't believe there are to this day, but it certainly wasn't in 2017, any monuments to Indigenous people in Ottawa, any national monument. There, there was only one in 2017. That there was only one, which was to, to, to uh, Indigenous veterans. So those who went and fought in World War I and went and you know, participated in Canadian imperialism, those, those uh, uh, Indigenous people get commemorated. Uh, but, the, but the genocide against uh, First Nations here is... Uh, is um, is not uh, not uh, uh, um, uh, uh, commemorated an official uh, uh, monument, and so so it's uh, it's a it's a it, 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 to me it was very troubling to see how easily uh, Canadian Dimension got like was was pushing pushing this article and it, that again just like really fed this sort of uh, uh, this kind of like narrow, um, you know, the Nazi Holocaust is only about uh, a Jewish victimhood and it needs to be upheld as the preeminent uh, horror ever. And, and, um, and it obviously is, you know, incredible horror, maybe even the worst horror ever. Uh, but, but the, the kind of like more uh, broader understanding uh, of the Nazis and uh, is you know erased from it. So, for instance, I would I would guess that you know most um, Canadian adults are aware that six million uh, Jews were killed by the Nazis, but most the vast majority are not aware that um, that you know up to twenty million or so uh, uh, Slavs, as many as twenty million Slavs, were killed uh, uh, by the Nazis. Let alone all the, you know, as many as 20 million Chinese were actually killed, or I think that number's a bit in dispute, but some 10 plus million uh, Chinese killed during World War II, and sort of um, some of that uh, context. But but we have uh, uh, Mr. Norman Finkelstein here. Thanks a lot for, for coming on, um, uh, Norman. And um, I wanted to uh, begin with a question about just sort of like what, you know, you wrote this, this groundbreaking book, I guess, 20 plus years ago, uh, uh, the Holocaust industry. Uh, it's of course something that is a very sensitive subject, and people get get quite offended by even you know using that term. Um, uh, but what what is what is the Holocaust industry according to your uh, uh, definition, uh, Norman? You're you're muted. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for having me and excuse my lateness, but either my mind is cluttered with nonsense or it's the effects of old age setting in. I hope and pray it's the first and not the second. Um, first of all, I think it's important to make out the basic distinction, which ought to be obvious to everybody, namely that there's the actual historical event about which there's not serious dispute that it occurred, namely the Nazi Holocaust. There are aspects of it that are still uh, areas of serious con uh, contention among, serious, among uh, competent historians. So for example, 
When does the Nazi Holocaust begin? Historians, competent historians who have studied the matter very closely, uh, there's no consensus on when, on the inception of the Nazi Holocaust. Uh, there was, so far as we know, there was no formal order or secret order. Uh, the greatest of Nazi Holocaust historians, Raoul Hilberg, he was of the opinion that there probably was a secret order, but it's so far not been confirmed in the documentary record. In any event, the question of when still remains open. Secondly, the question of why. Why did Hitler uh, initiate the Nazi Holocaust, or the extermination program? Uh, again, no consensus among competent historians, which is to say the actual event, namely somewhere between five and six million Jews were exterminated, uh, systematically, methodically exterminated in the course of World War II. Uh, that's not open to serious question. Let me just check what just popped up. Okay. It's not open to serious question, but certain aspects of it are. So when I refer to the Holocaust industry, I'm not referring to the historical event. I'm referring to its manipulation and exploitation by various parties, interest groups, uh, most notably, at least at its inception, most notably the state of Israel. But Israel uh, pre-1967 was pretty much an economic backwater and it didn't have the resources to turn the propagandization, the exploitation of the Nazi Holocaust into what turned into a veritable industry. Uh, once the United States and Israel aligned after the June 1967 war, um, one of the consequences was that the Nazi Holocaust entered public life in the United States. Up until, you could say, roughly speaking, up until 1970, there was barely any mention of the Nazi Holocaust in the United States. There were just a couple of books. For example, when Hannah Arendt goes to Jerusalem to, write, uh, to report on the prosecution of Adolf Eichmann, she writes a book, it was originally articles in the New Yorker magazine, and then it became a book. Uh, she writes a book called Eichmann in Jerusalem, and she has a bibliography. The bibliography, believe it or not, includes only two books in the English language, because that's all there was up until, she writes it in 1964. Up until 64, 65, there's really nothing in the Nazi Holocaust in the United States. It's not a subject of uh, public interest. There are various reasons for that, but time won't allow us. Um, after 1967, the Nazi Holocaust enters American public life, and largely because, not entirely, but largely because it becomes a useful weapon in order to um, suppress any criticism is of Israel. The basic argument went, not to very complicate, the Nazi Holocaust was unique, what came to be called the uniqueness doctrine, which is to say no other people in the history of humanity had ever suffered the way Jews suffered during the Nazi Holocaust. New Jewish suffering was unique, and because Jewish suffering was unique, therefore conventional, conventional moral legal standards should not apply to it. That is to say that conventional international law standards, conventional human rights standards, Israel shouldn't be held to those conventional standards because the suffering it endured during the Nazi Holocaust was unconventional, that is to say, it was unique. And so the Nazi Holocaust then became a weapon 
in Israel's ideological arsenal and the arsenal of those defending Israel in the West, that we can hold Israel to the same standard as other countries uh, in the world. And that basically gave uh, Israel carte blanche to carry on like a Mongol, uh, a Mongol horde rather than a state. Not that states carry on in a particularly nice way, uh, but Israel, there were, it was basically no holds barred. It was able to carry on as it chose uh, uh, without any inhibitions and certainly without any external constraints or fetters. And then another aspect of the Nazi Holocaust, which was short term, I would say, was it became an extortion racket, what came to be called the Holocaust reparations issue. Uh, it basically begins under President Clinton. One of President Clinton's biggest financial backers was the president of the World Jewish Congress, Edgar Bronfman. And there was a kind of quid pro quo established between the World Jewish Congress and um, uh, Bill, the Bill Clinton administration, namely in return for the support, the financial support that Bronfman lent Clinton. Clinton backed these completely fraudulent claims about Holocaust reparations, first targeting the Swiss banks and then targeting German industry and various other entities. Uh, but once Clinton left office, that particular shakedown, although it continues to this day, Angela Merkel, uh, who, who fancied herself the only anti-Nazi in the history, in the post-war history of Germany, uh, she kept pouring out compensation monies to these crooked Jewish organizations. Uh, but that was basically, as I said, it was a transient phenomenon. But the exploitation of Nazi Holocaust for political gain, it continues. And it's most, I would say, it's most uh, virulent uh, manifestation right now is what's called the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. Now, IRA, the reason I mentioned the Nazi Holocaust in this context is the IRA stands for the International Holocaust Remembrance Association, IHRA. And it's this organization that's been pushing very hard, relentlessly, relentlessly, in every level of government and cultural life and institutional life, whether it be state governments in the United States, city councils in the United States, the federal government, congressional legislation, every, oh, I'm actually, I left out universities, university life at every level, pushing relentlessly like a juggernaut to impose this uh, definition of anti Semitism, which has nothing whatsoever, zero to do with anti Semitism. It's all about shielding Israel from any criticism of uh, its uh, criminal actions. So I would say in contemporary life, probably the, uh, the most abusive use of the Nazi Holocaust uh, has been with this pursuit of this relentless pursuit of the IRA, International Holocaust Remembrance Association, uh, definition of anti-Semitism. And that, that dynamic, of course, has gone on very aggressively in Canada at the city council level, university level, provincial level, and um, the uh, anti-Palestinian organizations have pushed that uh, very aggressively here. And that was actually part of my concern with the Canadian Dimensions article was that even in the context of all this discussion around uh, it, uh, uh, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's anti-Palestinian definition of anti-Semitism that still there was the you know left important left-wing media outlet would be um, uh, sort of jumping right into uh, a very uh, um, 
unique defense of the Holocaust monument in Ottawa. But but and also I think that I, to broaden the question beyond just Palestine and uh, obviously it's primarily a Palestine issue. But but if we look at uh, Jeremy Corbyn in uh, in England, uh, the Labour leader in, in Britain, uh, part of the campaign against him and and labeling him an anti semite. Uh, was also they also forced the British Labour Party to adopt the IHRA uh, uh, definition, and then that was used to then purge a big chunk of the party. Um, so one of the things I'm really struck by in in all of this kind of discussion is how there's a very clear example in Britain of the internationalist sort of socialist left being attacked. Uh, uh, by claiming anti-Semitism. We have many sort of smaller examples within Canada of, of uh, progressive movements being targeted in that, in that way. I have no doubt that if there was a real eco-socialist, internationalist uh, political force politician that got some traction in Canada, that a similar type campaign that happened against Jeremy Corbyn would happen against uh, them here in Canada. We even actually even saw some of that with Bernie Sanders. There's even a little bit of an effort to do that with Bernie Sanders, which is particularly kind of outrageous. Uh, Bernie Sanders, you know, just to get the, I totally agree with you. I mean, it's very predictable what will happen if uh, any candidate with any uh, uh, any traction to win uh, important office uh, and is in any way uh, sensitive to the, the plight of the Palestinians, that they're going to be attacked on those grounds of uh, anti-Semitism. You know, as a factual matter, it uh, it didn't happen with uh, Bernie Sanders for two reasons. The main reason is he never got to the finishing line. Now, what would have happened if he actually won the Democratic uh, primary? I think probably they would have attempted something along the lines of what was done to Jeremy Corbyn, but he never got that far. And second of all, he had a certain amount of immunity. Now I'm not saying the immunity would have held up if he actually uh, became the nominee. I think he would have won if he became the nominee, but that's you know speculation that would take us too far afield to discuss it. I think he probably would have won, but uh, since he didn't get that far, uh, they didn't try to play that card mostly because he was a Brooklyn Jew and he was as Jewish as you, as any stereotype of Jew, of a Jew can get. Uh, he had lost uh, a distant, extended family in Poland during the Nazi Holocaust. And so it would have looked slightly ridiculous to attack him as a Holocaust denier as he replies in the Brooklyn Jewish drawl, <laughs> Can you call me a Holocaust denier? It was just completely preposterous. But but do you do you have thoughts on on so what do we do to insulate ourselves? If, if, you know we hope we don't have that that movement right now that's powerful, but we hope some somewhere not too long, far down the road. What do we do to insulate ourselves from the inevitable attack? Well, here is an area of serious contention. I'm not saying anybody is is displaying bad faith, but there is serious, you know, it's not like good faith versus bad faith, truth versus untruth, opportunism versus principle. There are areas of serious disagreement um, about this question. And basically, I would say it's a version, a version of the whole free speech issue, namely, what degree of toleration do you give to ideas that you find appalling? My personal opinion, uh, and if you wish to probe me on it, I've given it a lot of thought. I believe I've given it a lot of thought. My personal opinion is that labels like anti-Semite, anti racist, misogynist, homophobe, uh, they're not useful in trying to reach truth. Now, if you think truth is an important value, and I do believe it, it, it is, and I believe the revolutionary socialist movement, the tradition uh, with which I still at my ripe old age, uh, still deeply identify, it always held up truth as a very significant value. If you believe truth is a significant value, 
then I don't see the point of these labels. The question is not whether or not what somebody's saying is anti-Semitic. The question is whether or not what the person is saying is true. Same thing with the with a racist. The question is not whether or not, in my opinion, the question is not whether or not a, a particular individual is a racist or whether you believe what he or she is saying is racist. The critical question is whether or not what the person is saying is true, which is another way of saying I oppose any kind of constraints, limits, uh, taboos on any kind of exchange of opinions where truth is our goal, uh, uh, which cannot be, in my opinion, they cannot be uh, pursued uh, in the manner that John Stuart M or Mill once said, uh, free, fearless, uh, free, fearless, and there was another term, adjective, free, fearless, and I'll, it'll come back to me. But it can, uh, it can, uh, these ideas can't be pursued in a free, fearless way when there are always these taboos, which are basically conversation stoppers. Namely, you hurl the label anti-Semite, you hurl the label racist, you hurl the label misogynist, you hurl the label homophobic, transphobic, and that kills the discussion. They're designed to be conversation stoppers. So when you ask me what to do, my first response is I would oppose any kinds of constraints, limits, or discussions and freedom of discussion in the name of suppressing anti-Semitism, suppressing racism, suppressing this ism or that ism. I oppose all of those uh, kinds of legislation or taboos, you know, on, on public debate of these questions. So I think that's the, the first and the most important thing to do to free up public discussion of these uh, uh, efforts to suppress discussion. Secondly, uh, and when it comes to matters of legislation bearing on equal opportunity, let's say a landlord or a law firm or a school discriminates on the basis of you being Jewish, okay, or you being African American, you being a woman, so on and so forth. Uh, my uh, considered opinion, having thought about this and looked into a closely, is there's no need for definitions like racism, anti uh, racism, racism, anti Semitism. We don't need those definitions. We've carried on quite successfully, I might add, in r ridding our, our meaning American, I can't speak for Canadian. We have carried on for decades now, quite successfully, in ridding public life of discriminatory uh, behavior, whether it's in housing, education, uh, social services, of ridding uh, our society of those uh, uh, discriminatory practices without any definitions of anti-Semitism, racism, misogyny. We never had those definitions in the United States. We had equal opportunity laws, which protected everybody from various kinds of discrimination without having to define anti-Semitism, without having to define racism. We never did that. It was never considered a need, which is another way of saying, a long-winded way of saying, we don't need these definitions in order to fight discrimination within the law. The law has been able to rid our society of a, a large amount of discriminatory behavior without these definitions. The moment you start creating these definitions, they become political weapons and propaganda tools they're not designed, in my opinion, to actually protect people from 
discriminatory behavior or dis discriminatory practices, not behavior, discriminatory practices. We can get on perfectly fine. United States, you know, the United States, the United States uh, before World War II, there were all sorts of discriminations against Jews, whether it be in law firms, country clubs. Uh, uh, Harvard had a quota on Jews, there were all these things. And we enacted then after World War II, actually not most significantly during the civil rights movement, of which one of the main beneficiaries in the United States, it's often forgotten, one of the main beneficiaries was Jews of the civil rights movement. Uh, we enacted all sorts of legislation, in particular in 1964, the Voting, the Voting Rights Act, and then 1965, um, the, uh, slips my mind, my memory's going to pop. Um, uh, we enacted all sorts of legislation without any need for definitions uh, to rid our society, at least of anti-Semitism, and in significant part, I'm not saying it's been a complete success, but in significant part of uh, formal legal protections for anti-Semites, racist bigots. So the law was now on our side, the side of what's right. Uh, without any need of these definitions. So I'm totally against the definitions. They're totally unnecessary, including, by the way, racist. I'm not for the ra uh, defining racism and law. I'm for defining equal opportunity and non-discrimination into law. But I'm against all of these definitions. I, see that they, I don't see that they serve any political purpose uh, when it comes to law and they have a very stifling effect when it comes to free speech. So it's not because I'm a free speech absolutist. That's, you know, for me, that's not the real issue. The real issue is if you're committed to the idea of truth, then these labels are truth seeking stoppers or inhibitors uh, where I think there should be free and open discussion and uh, come what may. Uh, I would like to leave some time for people to ask some questions, but I just have one last question. What, what's your sort of opinion on the new Israeli government, uh, briefly? Well, you know, uh, I'll call you Eves, though we don't know each other. Uh, Eves, uh, I, I go back a long way. And each time a new government comes to power, there's always this, oh, my God, this is a horrible government. This is a fascist government. This is uh, terrible. This is awful. Um, in, in, uh, in 1977, when Menachem Begin came to power in Israel, up in between 48 and 67, it was all Labor Party. Uh, it was basically a uh, autocracy in Israel led by the Labor Party. Labor Party was very repressive of any free speech. Uh, they basically were part of the socialist Bolshevik tradition uh, the early Zionists were socialist Zionists, they were uh, uh, Marxist Zionists, and there was very little tolerance of freedom of speech. And the Labour Party, when it came to power with Ben-Gurion in 1949, was basically, uh, of uh, 48, uh, was basically part of that very repressive uh, tradition. And uh, so up until 67, it was all Labour Party up until 77, excuse me, it was all Labor Party. Now, Menachem Begin comes to power, and if you go back, now this is 1977, there's this whole huge hue and cry that Menachem Begin is a fascist, he traces back his roots to Jabotinsky, and that in 1948, Hannah Arendt and a large number of other people had written a famous letter condemning uh, Begin for his uh, fascist beliefs, he comes to power. Then we had in 1982, uh, Ariel Sharon, who was known as the butcher of uh, Beirut, a really a, a war criminal in a, on a fairly substantial uh, scale. Of course, Israel is a small country, so relative to the world, he's not substantial, but relative to his power, yes, he was a substantial war criminal. By, nine, by 2000 or the 2000s, uh, Sharon is being hailed as 
a peacemaker and a liberal. And each government gets worse and worse and worse. So I don't attach too much significance to this new government. It's horrible. I have no doubt about that. Uh, there are reasons to, for concern. I have no doubt about it. But the basic trend and tendency of Israel, not just the government, let's be clear about that. Remember, I said to you between 1948 and 1977, which is a substantial number of years, given that Israel has only been around a short period of time, for roughly 30 years, they had Labor Party uh, governments. Uh, now there is no Labor Party in Israel. It doesn't exist. It's, it's an a infinitesimal, it has an infinitesimal presence on the political spectrum. And Netanyahu is now basically, he himself, I don't mean his coalition, he himself is now considered the center of the Israeli political spectrum. Um, so uh, I'm sure it's going to do horrible things. I'm sure the US is going to turn its head, but these are all manifestations of the fact that Israel, not as just at the political party or government level, but Israel as a society has moved further and further and further to the right, to the point that it actually occupies, I, I could be corrected on this, and I'm happy to be corrected if I'm mistaken, but it occupies a unique place in the world. Because in every other country where the what's called the alt right has come into power, there's always been a so to speak alt left to balance out the alt right. So you take a typical case like uh, Brazil, you have a Bolsonaro alt right, but you also have a Lula uh, alt left. And now Lula is in power, Bolsonaro is out of power, even though it was very close. You know, the election was decided by. A, a fraction of a percentage point uh, between the two. So society is roughly split in, Bra in uh, Brazil, but there is a, a substantial left. Uh, in India, I would say that's probably also the case. Uh, and in the United States, we had, a, uh, I, I wouldn't call, I don't believe uh, Trump is a, a fascist in the conventional sense. We could disagree about that. But we had the Trumpian phenomenon, and we had what it was balanced out by the Sanders phenomenon. And my own view, as I said, not this is not the place for it. I think Sanders would have beaten Trump, and he would have been uh, he had a good shot to be president, except for the fact that the whole ruling elite, with its media and money uh, arms, would have used would have united to stop the Sanders, the Sanders presidency. But in terms of popular support, popular support, I think he would have won. Now I mention all this because I believe that Israel is unique in the world. There is no left to balance out the right. There is a right, there's a far right, and there's an ultra right. So there's a Netanyahu, then there's a far right, and there's an ultra right. There's no left anymore in Israel. And we have to, again, bear in mind, uh, we're not just talking about the political level. We're talking about the popular, popular level. Israeli society is, as a whole, not in part, as a whole, it's off the spectrum. Uh, Yuri, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ivan. Wow, uh, Mr. Finkelstein, everything you said spot on couldn't agree with you uh, more and it's a and it's it's a real honor to get the chance to to uh, speak to you um question uh yeah three very quick uh questions i wanted to ask is why do you think jeremy corbyn and others part of his campaign didn't call uh bs to a smear to, to an obvious smear campaign and then flip it use it as a way to teach about Palestine, settler colonialism, and Zionism, given so many of the people who were falsely accused of anti-Semitism were 
Jewish anti-Zionist voices, and then I wanted to know if 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 he, if, uh, if you're still opposed to the uh, BDS effort movements, and then what do you think it's going to take? Since we are talking about settler colonialism, what do you think it's going to take in the U.S. Uh, for uh, more of the people power movements to show more solidarity to uh, and attention to the plight of? Native Americans, Indigenous Hawaiians, and Indigenous Alaskans. I'm curious your thoughts on that. Well, on the on the first question, I don't want to say anything negative about Jeremy Corbyn. Everybody has his or her faults. Uh, I felt that Corbyn, and I'm not saying this in a vicious way. I want that clear. Uh, I think he was a weak leader. He he was just too nice. And you know, nice guys finish last, and that's for sure the case in politics. He kept thinking that if he showed good faith, that he could persuade people that they are quote unquote mistaken. But the other side was not suffering under a misapprehension. They weren't concerned about anti-Semitism, they were concerned about Jeremy Corbyn's domestic and international agenda. And they were just using and exploiting and pretending to be fearful of anti-Semitism in order to unseat Jeremy Corbyn or prevent him from unseat him in the Labour Party and I'll, uh, prevent him from ever coming into higher office. He took their claims, their allegations, he took them at face value, as in they really believe what they're saying. And if I can only persuade them otherwise, uh, they will happily join us in our effort. Uh, and it was not just the Labour Party. There's a certain, excuse me, it wasn't just the Jewish community. There's a certain misunderstanding of what happened, in my opinion. What happened was the Jewish organizations were the tip of the spear. However, it was the whole of British elite society, Marx's ruling class, it was the whole of them that wanted to stop Jeremy Corbyn. If you looked, I follow the campaign quite closely. I have comrades in the UK, Jamie Stern Weiner, uh, Alex Nunn. I have quite a few people who are deeply involved in these, uh, Deborah McCoby, uh, who are deeply involved and who kept me informed. And I you know, read a lot as it was unfolding. Uh, it was from the Guardian newspaper, all the way over to the tabloids, they all were out for blood against Jeremy Corbyn. It was BBC to Sky News and everything in between that wanted to stop Jeremy Corbyn. And not trivially, it was the whole, the whole of the Labour Party leadership that wanted to stop Jeremy Corbyn. He was a fluke. He was a fluke, just like Bernie Sanders was a fluke. If you recall, when Bernie started out in 2016, he just thought, this, I'll go out and make a few speeches for socialism. He himself was shocked at what emerged. These mm -hmm. <laughs> 25,000 person rallies wherever he went. So uh, the ruling elite in the UK, of course, were shocked by what by the the support uh, that Corbyn got, uh, you know, huge numbers of people joining the Labour Party at that point to support uh, um, Jeremy Corbyn. So they all used the anti-Semitism. I mean, every newspaper, every broadcast that Corbyn was an anti-Semite. No matter how many reports, no matter how much documentation was adduced to show there's no basis for this, 
it made no difference because they all latched on to this. At the beginning, it was a Jewish elite strategy because they were concerned about Israel. But by the end, everybody had jumped on the bandwagon because they were concerned about Corbyn's whole domestic and international agenda and the fact that he had inspired the mass movement. So I think Corbyn misread because he's a very decent guy. He is, no question in my mind about that. He's a decent, humble guy. He misread what was going on by acting in good faith that what his adversaries were saying was being said in good faith. That it wasn't all just a pretense and pretext to try to stop him and the movement that he represented. Um, on your second point, it's a very strange thing that people keep asking my opinion on BDS when there is no BDS. The Palestine struggle for now, I'm not saying forever, for now it's moribund. There is no BDS, there is no divestment, there is no um, boycott, there is no sanctions, there is nothing. If you look at the actual um, record, the reason BDS is alive and why it remains on life support is because of the state of Israel. Israel uses, it exploits BDS as it proclaims that behind every critic of Israel lurks a supporter of BDS who wants to destroy the Jewish state. So they keep using BDS in order to delegitimize all criticism of Israel and also like the IRA, the IHRA definition, to put legislation on the books condemning BDS, illegalizing BDS, delegitimizing BDS in order to put uh, limits on any criticism of the state of Israel. It's Israel that's kept BDS on life support. There is no BDS anymore. Whether there ever actually was is a matter of dispute. Uh, in my opinion, there wasn't. If you look at the actual BDS resolutions that were, say, passed by universities or colleges, those resolutions simply referred to, to uh, ending the occupation uh, of the West Bank in Gaza, stopping the settlement construction, stopping uh, human rights abuses, but that's not BDS. That's what the BDS movement itself called um, Zionist, uh, Zionist, um, liberal Zionism. It had nothing to do with, in, uh, you couldn't find a single resolution the whole history of BDS. If you take the planks of the BDS platform, plank number one was um, ending the occupation. Plank number two was full rights for Arabs in Israel or Palestinian Arabs in Israel. And plank number three was full implementation of the right of return. If you go through the resolutions that were passed or the boycotts during the heyday of BDS, none of them ever spoke about implementing the right of return. None of them really, well, there may have been some that called for equal rights for Jews in Israel, but none of them, Palestinian Arabs in Israel, but none of them called for the dismantlement of the state of Israel. None of them even called for ending a Jewish state. They did not. If you take the most radical places like Berkeley and look at the resolution that was passed in Berkeley, it was just uh, what 
BDS called a Zionist left resolution. As a practical matter, as a practical matter, there never was a BDS. But as a practical matter now, there are not even any resolutions anymore. There's no boycotts anymore. The only reason we discuss it is because Israel keeps it alive. A rational movement, had the Palestine movement been rational, which it hasn't in large part been, not since, I would say, uh, the end of the 2010s, during the period 2000 to roughly 2010, the movement was quite rational. The BDS took it way off the spectrum. But a rational movement would set goals which are realizable and which would have a real effect on people's lives, a goal like lifting the blockade of Gaza. That would have been a goal of a movement. But the BDS, the three-point platform, had nothing to do with the real world, nothing at all. There was no possibility at this point in time of implementing uh, in full the Palestinian right of return. It was just posing and preening. It's like in the United States, we have all these fake leftists who talk about prison abolitionism. Is there any possibility that prisons are going to be abolished as a item on a political agenda? I'm not saying, hey, I would... Uh, I'm all for communism, I'm old fashioned in those things. And certainly our prison, what's called prison industrial complex, uh, wouldn't coexist with a communist society. I have no doubt about that. But these aren't, these, these aren't realistic political objectives. They're just preening and posing for the cameras. And the same thing with BDS. They have no relationship whatsoever to the real world. Uh, and since I think uh, concern about the real world should be uh, uppermost for a person of the left, um, I, I have no uh, I have no interest in that sort of stuff. I did as a child. I'll admit that a, child, a young man. Uh, yes, I had posters in my room saying, uh, "Long live the dictatorship of the proletariat." and pictures of Chinese workers and peasants holding banners saying socialism is, is advancing from victory to victory, but I'm more than an adult now, and I don't indulge in that kind of nonsense. Even though I remain fully steeped in the radical tradition, I still have the highest regard for people like Rosa Luxemburg, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, Leon Trotsky. It was a heroic era. And we can learn a lot from that era, but we can't learn anything, in my opinion, from this infantile leftism. It's not even leftism. It's just preening and posing. You know, uh, you know, yesterday was the 104th anniversary of the murder of Rosa Luxemburg. And she was a, a truly astonishing historic personality. The degree of conviction, commitment, brilliance, culture. Uh, it's a very impressive show. And what do we have now? We have people who think it's a revolutionary act. I mean, it's literally, they think it's a revolutionary act to change their pronouns from she, her to they, them. And it's a subject of exaltation, uh, <laughs> these, uh, preenings and posings from the camera. Uh, it's, a, it's a pathetic what's happened to the left. The BDS is just one more campus cult with transpho, uh, tra uh, tra uh, uh, fighting transphobia, misogyny, settler colonialism, capitalism, imperialism, and all these. It's just, a, it's a just these are just creepy uh, navel gazing cults. And BDS is part of that spectrum now, the spectrum of irrelevance. Uh, as to your third question, I think the three major uh, 
issues confronting humanity now are uh, obviously climate change, though I wouldn't put climate change first now. I would say, given the, 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 uh, the hyenas and jackals currently in the US government leadership, there is a real a serious threat uh, of nuclear war, um, a terminal nuclear war. There is a serious possibility of that. It's playing itself out in its first phase in Ukraine. If we get past that first phase, and I think it's problematic that we'll get past it. Um, if we get past it, then the second phase will be the war that US is already preparing with China. So as an immediate threat, I would place global, uh, climate change second, I would put nuclear war first. And then there's the fact that for a large part of the industrialized world, capitalism has reached an impasse. It's unable to <clears throat> it's unable to satisfy the basic criteria of any legitimate regime. A legitimate regime, whether it's socialist, communist, capitalist, or feudalist, its basic legitimacy measure is: is it able to improve the living standard of the next generation as compared to the generation that preceded it? If it's able to register an improvement, then that regime commands almost invariably a degree of legitimacy, at least among its own domestic population. So you take a place like China, where the corruption is beyond belief, the power is consolidated in a handful of people. But the fact remains that for the average Chinese person, the standard of living continues to improve from one generation to another. And so far, therefore, there haven't been major outbreaks of resistance. There has been obviously resistance with COVID and other things, but there has and there have been resistance in factories, uh, multi uh, transnational factories uh, in China. But in general, the, reg the regime commands a certain degree of legitimacy. In the United States, that's over. Uh, the United States, about 20% are doing from very good to spectacular. And around 80%, uh, there's no future, none. Uh, and I'm not being, I'm not exaggerating here. I know my country. For about 80%, especially young people, there's no future. If you take a place like New York City, uh, if you're in IT or finance, you're doing fine. But for the other 80%, they're mostly in gigs. We're called gigs, you know, the gig economy, three dead end jobs with no benefits and barely a salary. Uh, so, and there's no, so far as I can tell, I'm not a trained economist, but so far as I can tell, uh, there doesn't seem to be any prospect that the capitalist system uh, is able to create that improvement from generation to generation, quite the contrary. Uh, the new generation is lagging so far behind my generation, it's kind of breathtaking to observe what's happened in our societies. So it's a tragedy because lives are destroyed, lives are wasted, lives are squandered. And people with real talent, real ability, uh, who can contribute a lot in a fair world, uh, they're driven to these dead end jobs, antidepressants, uh, and meaningless lives. So that to me is the third major challenge, uh, how to radically transform a system that no longer commands any legitimacy. So your questions about settler colonialism and the rights of various peoples, I consider those my own judgment. And obviously we can uh, uh, dis disagree and agree to disagree. Uh, I consider those secondary challenges as against uh, the real prospect of nuclear war, a terminal nuclear war, 
uh, the real prospect of a terminal disaster in our climate and the reality of an economic system that no longer functions for about 80% of the society. Respectful agree to disagree. <laughs> go, go, go ahead, go ahead, Hans. Just as long as you don't call me a racist colonialist settler. Uh, I would never, <laughs> I would never, Mr. Norman, I would never. Listen, <laughs> young people do that to me nowadays. When I go on college, rarely I speak anymore, but when I do, I oh, get come on, one plus one. We'll have a, and we'll, okay. have a and we'll have a polite conversation. Can, can somebody else have a crack at it? Or... Go ahead, Hans. Go ahead, uh, Norman. If I may be so free to call you by your first name, mm -hmm. it does indeed take time to delve into the real history, and I am smitten by what you have said so far. I think our time is short. And I would therefore like to ask you for a return engagement as one of a very keen audience uh, here in Canada that would like to field some more questions at you. Um, my own particular question I'll hold in abeyance because I think Eve is, uh, is running out of time. Uh, Eve, tell me, do I have time to pose my question? Yeah, go, go, yeah go ahead. Yeah, we're past time, but we go one last question. Well, Hitler, and I'm going back to the origins of the Holocaust, uh, Hitler enjoyed a, a great deal of ambivalence. Uh, Chamberlain is an example. And by hyphenating Judeo-Bolshevism, uh, he clearly gained a lot of sympathy among the uh, Western ruling classes. Um, you mentioned uh, Trotsky, uh, Kamenev, Zinoviev, Rosa Luxemburg. They were all leading Bolsheviks. And well, Rosa wasn't in, a Bolshevik, but certainly sympathetic. Well, Rosa Luxemburg was a Polish uh, German socialist. Yeah, I, I said and, sympathetic, yes. And in bringing that closer to Germany, uh, this threat of a socialist revolution, much closer to Germany, Hitler exploited the class struggle with the racism incipient in the uh, conservative Prussian layers. And today's Holocaust industry erases that dimension of the origins of the Holocaust. And we find uh, rather echoes of, we've, we've seen the, the consequences of a propaganda cold war for 50 years, and we deny the similar effect of anti-Semitism in explaining the rise of Hitler. The I don't want to... conjuncture of the, the, the anti-socialist fight, uh, linking it with anti-Semitism was what enabled Hitler to get elected? Um, I don't want to get it. First of all, uh, there was a point in my life when I read all the available scholarship in English on the subject, of which there was a lot. I, I wrote a, I wrote one book and I wrote a half of another book uh, pertaining to the Nazi Holocaust, and I read all of the scholarship. Uh, the scholars, the scholarship as of then. I have to be careful because now we're in 2023. And it's 23 years after I did all that reading. Um, but the scholarship back then was, I think there was a broad consensus that the anti Semitism did not play a leading role in Hitler's rise to power. Uh, it's clear up until 1929, Hitler, the Nazi Party, was a very marginal organization in Germany. I think it got like between three and 5% of the vote. Immediately after the Great Depression, uh, went up to, I think, 18 point something percent of the vote. And then it started to uh, snowball, uh, eventually getting, I guess, in the last election, 44% uh, of the vote. And then combined with the far right parties, uh, it, it got the majority. Um, Anti-Semitism during the period after the Great Depression, it was a kind of an add-on 
it had appealed to certain people and it was used by the Nazis and Hitler. Uh, but the main issue was restoring Germany's uh, economy uh, uh, after the Great Depression. Um, now, on this question of erasing history, uh, here we may disagree again, and we'll have to free, be free to disagree. Uh, it's most striking in the case of the Ukraine. Uh, listen, I was just reading Rosa Luxemburg's writings from the 1905 Russian Revolution. Uh, she she uh, was in the German Social Democratic Party. She was in, responsible for covering the uh, in their newspapers, in the newspapers, for covering the Russian Revolution of 1905. And you can't help but notice that the major outbreaks of anti-Semitism, uh, Kiev, Mariupol, they're all Ukraine. They're overwhelmingly, not all, overwhelmingly in the Ukraine. Come 1918, 19, in the Ukraine, you would say between, the estimates are between 50 and 200,000 Jews were murdered in the Ukraine by uh, <clears throat> right-wing forces. And during World War II, the same right-wing was responsible for huge massacres of Jews and Poles. Uh, this fellow, uh, Stefan Bandera, uh, who was aligned for a period of time with the Nazis, was responsible for the murder, mass murders of Jews and Poles. And a significant element of Ukraine society today, uh, a significant element, honors and traces back its pedigree, its political pedigree, to these right-wing murderous pogromists. And there are streets, monuments named after Bandera and others. And in our media, any mention of this history, and present, and present, any mention of the history and the present, you take the case of before Kirsten, the major battle in Ukraine was fought in Mariupol. You'll, you will remember the, the giant steel mill. Well, who was holed up in Mariupol? It was all, all entirely Azov battalion militants. The Azov battalions are self-identified Nazis. They're self-identified Nazis. Any mention of this, any mention of this means you're an apologist for Putin. And you're, you're casting as the time, New York Times likes to call it, whenever you mention any Nazi reality in Ukraine, you're casting slurs on Ukraine. And the Jewish organizations have been right there giving the government, which at armed forces, which frankly are packed with Nazis, and then say, the predominant element, but the significant element, back with Nazis or neo-Nazis as they like to call it. Uh, uh, anybody who mentions those facts are Putin apologists, and including in Jewish organizations like the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League. Well, I don't know if they're Jewish, Jewish mafia organizations. Uh, so that kind of uh, whitewashing uh, of the precursors of the Nazis in the Ukraine, then the actual allies of the Nazis in the Ukraine, and now the successors of the Nazis in the Ukraine, um, I mean, can't mention it. That's taboo. It makes you an apologist for Putin. And by the way, um, in my opinion, it's the source of uh, the greatest reason for not just concern, but a terrifying concern. Because these are, uh, these are crazed people. 
And if it looks like they're losing the war against Russia, if and when that moment comes, the US, the lunatic, the jackals and hyenas, uh, and the murder industries, which is a, a phrase I noticed in Rosa Luxemburg, which I rather like. She, refer, she refused to call them the armaments or war industries. She called them the murder industries. The hyenas and jackals in the Biden administration and the murder industries have provided these right-wing lunatics with cutting edge precision technology, military technology. And I think there's a very good chance that if it seems they're going down, they're gonna take everybody else with them. They have the technology now, the precision missiles, the drones to target Russia's nuclear uh, reactors. It's a very serious problem. You will recall a few months ago, there was a lot of talk about these missiles that were being fired in the vicinity of the, I can never pronounce its name, but the Russian nuclear reactor, the, the, the nuclear reactor controlled by Russia in the Ukraine. And the United States, you know, the kind of infantile propaganda that's not believed by anybody except true believers was saying, we don't know if it's the Ukrainians or the Russians who are targeting or are firing rockets in the vicinity of the nuclear reactor. Why Russia would fire rockets at a reactor that it controls is like, you know, a little bit strange. Um, but to my thinking, it was obvious that the right wing lunatics who are part of the Ukrainian army, they've been incorporated, so they get all the weapons. They were transmitting a message to Russia. If we go, you're going with us. That was the message that was being transmitted with those rockets that were being fired in the vicinity of the nuclear reactor. And I think there's a very real danger, which has not been even openly discussed, of what will happen if and when they lose when they're armed, these right-wing lunatics who trace their uh, political pedigree back to the Nazis, what will they do with those weapons? You might recall, now I've not read the most recent history, so I have to, or the most recent scholarship, but at the time when I read it, Hitler wanted to destroy Germany at the end because he said they didn't live up to their, uh, their uh, reputation as Aryan Superman because they lost the war. And he gave the order to destroy parts of Germany. And according to uh, Speer, Albert Speer, he countermanded the order. But Hitler said, if you know, you proved you weren't, you didn't rise to the occasion, and we're going to destroy us with them, meaning the Western powers, or yeah, the West, we'll call it Western powers, the allies. Uh, I think there's a very serious danger that's going to happen in the Ukraine. You know, the they got those weapons now. Ukraine isn't just must be the, one of the two or three most corrupt places in Europe. So even if it were the case that the right-wing crazies like the Azov battalions, even if it were the case, they were separate from the Ukrainian army, there is still the danger that the weapons will end up in their hands. But now they're part, they've been incorporating the Ukrainian army. They were the quote unquote resistance in Mariupol. Uh, and with those weapons and the prospect of defeat, you know, it could be Samson's temple, Samson in the temple, the Samson option. Very, uh, uh, a very tough moment now. I don't, 
I don't know what the Russians are planning for that eventuality, but I hope they have figured out something because from the Biden administration, you're not gonna get anything. These are monsters. I'm not saying Putin's not a monster, but my impression, if we can use the expression, he's a rational monster. <laughs> the, the, the people in the White House, in the midst of all the horror unfolding in the Ukraine, that octogenarian witch, uh, Nancy Pelosi, she goes over to Taiwan to stir up trouble there, as if one war were not enough. These people are completely crazy. They're monsters and irrational monsters because the greed is so consuming that whether it be climate change or nuclear war, they don't give a darn about their children, their grandchildren. They'll destroy the whole world with them. Uh, it's a very, very bad moment now. Very bad moment. Well, on on that uh, uplifting uh, <laughs> end, no, I think it's it's important. We got to be honest about the world, and I, I gen definitely agree with the uh, the uh, craziness of you know war and with Russia and Ukraine, and then possibly doing it with China over Taiwan simultaneously. It all seems. Completely bananas, especially when the climate. And yesterday, Biden is in Japan, urging Japan to arm itself. I mean, these are monsters. Let's be clear about that. These are monsters. If, if it were the case that their assassination would stop this juggernaut, I would completely, <laughs> totally support it. But it won't because it's the system. It's this whole system that needs to be gotten rid of. Now you may say, okay, this guy, he's 200 years old. Who cares what he has to say? No, that's a very rational, calm assessment of where we're at now. It is, we're hanging by a very thin thread. We're at the precipice. Uh, and unfortunately, not only are these people lunatics, but there's no opposition at all, none. In the United States, the so-called squad, the fashionistas, uh, they have voice literally zero, literally zero opposition to Biden's policies in Ukraine. Not even opposition, forget about opposition. They have not voiced a word of, forget criticism. There has not been a, a voice, they have not voiced a word of questioning. This is like the North Korean Central Committee, the way they carry on. Now, you take people who are completely mainstream in the United States, like John Mearsheimer, um, What's his name? Just slipped my mind from Columbia. Oh God, University. He'll come to me. Jeffrey Sachs? Yeah, Jeffrey Sachs, John Mearsheimer, various generals. They have all voiced criticism of Biden administration policy, okay? Why didn't the fashionistas, the squad, they could have just held hearings, as in congressional hearings. Let's hear the other side. Let's hear the other side. We won't agree with them, and we should have people answer them, but let's hear the other side. The most minimum, minimum demand, not opposition. I'm not calling, I'm not speaking of opposition. I'm not speaking of criticism. I'm just saying hearings. But they're just members of the North Korean Central Committee, no dissent from what the great leader says even if the great leader happens to be a mummy, you know? Like you Jeremy Corbyn, Norman, they're too nice. What? Like Jeremy Corbyn, they're too nice. <laughs> no, I don't think they're too nice. I think they're stupid. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the literal sense, stupid. They know nothing about politics. Uh, they're woke people. Uh, 
What's her name? AOC thinks the burning issue of the day is Republicans don't call Latinos Latin X. She does. She thinks that's a very important issue. Why an ethnic group would want to be called a porn site Latin X? I don't know. Doesn't make any sense to me. But she thinks this is the burning issue of our time. They're stupid and they're cowards and they're opportunists uh, and they want to stay in the safe side. You know, so Nancy Pelosi says, yeah, uh, Alexandria, that's a very important issue. You have to focus on getting uh, uh, Republicans to call us, call uh, you people Latin X and maybe Latin triple X, you know, uh, <laughs> just, just complete idiocy, complete, complete idiocy. I wish I could call them more than that, but they're not, you know, uh, uh, you can laugh and I laugh. I just wrote a whole book on the subject. And everybody who reads the book, the draft forms of it, it's coming out, I guess, in a couple of weeks. The response has always been hilarious. I sent chapters one by one to Professor Chomsky to read, uh, to elicit his opinion, and each chapter came back hilarious. Hilarious. Because, <laughs> you know, if it weren't for the fact that the, the fate of humanity is at stake, you know, we can set that aside. Uh, uh, these people are hilarious. They are. It's just a vast, it's a vast joke, uh, except that the subject matter isn't the laughing one. Well, thanks a lot uh, for your time. We're past the, uh, far, far past the hour. Um, thanks everyone for, uh, for staying on. Uh, same place, uh, same time uh, next week. And uh, thanks again, uh, Norman. Take care, everyone. Have a yeah, good night. Send me, send me the link if there is a link. I don't know. Did you record this? Yeah, yeah. I'll put it on YouTube and I'll send it to you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Yes. Uh, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Thank Fitz. You. Thanks, Steve. You're welcome. Bravo! 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 Yes. Thank you, Norman. Vincent Great job. Thank you. Encore! Encore!